Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. The webinar will be beginning in just a couple of minutes. Hello everyone and welcome to our July Research Roundtable on Epilepsy Diagnosis. Thank you so much all for joining us. We have a brilliant range of speakers today. Firstly, we'll be hearing from Amanda, who will be discussing her family's experience of epilepsy and of finding a diagnosis. And then we'll be hearing from researchers who have been funded by Epilepsy Research UK to investigate this area. We will be hearing from Professor John Terry at the University of Birmingham, whose work focuses on the use of mathematics to diagnose epilepsy, and Dr. Eleonora Lugara from University College London, who is working on developing a breathalyzer test to diagnose seizures. First of all, earlier this month, we spoke with Amanda, who discussed her family's experience of epilepsy and their journey to finding a diagnosis. My son was born in August last year. He's a twin, so he's a twin sister. Um, both of them were grand when they were born. Um, no issues there. Um, but around about four weeks old, Archer, um, my son started developing some really odd movements. Um, these were mostly when he was falling asleep, um, a kind of crunch, so like the top of his body was trying to meet the, the, the bottom half of his body, so he was kind of folding up um, when he was falling asleep. Um, so it, it happened a few times, maybe over a few days, and we thought that was a bit odd, and we checked with the health visitor at that point, who said it was startle reflex, nothing to worry about. Some babies get this when they're nodding off. Um, as, as we do as well as, as adults. Um, so yeah, fair enough, that, that sounded okay. Um, so then it's to say it was about four weeks old at this point. Um, and then these movements started to just progress over the next week or so to be more and more frequent, not just when he was nodding off, they were happening when he was waking up as well. Whilst he was asleep, they were actually waking him up. Um, and then again, progressed into happening just at completely random times of the day um and then one day he was just laying on the sofa next to me and the kind of both of them were in this little twin pillow we had when they were newborn um and i seen his left leg moving and his eyes opened and his eyes were rolling back it was just his left leg that was moving and i just thought at that point something's not right so we spoke to various people our health visitor our gp um at one point we called the doctor out in the middle of the night um, because as well as these movements, he was just so, so unsettled. He was, um, he just cried a lot and I don't exaggerate when I say for hours on end, um, he would cry, he didn't want to take his bottle. Um, yeah, just generally very, very unsettled uh, and these movements were happening as well and we didn't know if they were in any way related but um, now as parents there's a certain intuition that just tells you that something isn't right we, we didn't know what it was but we knew that something wasn't right um, so yeah at one point we even called the doctor out at like 3am as we'd been up all night he'd not stopped crying um, it, it just wasn't normal um, that doctor at that point thought maybe perhaps a cow's milk allergy every other uh, doctor at this point had said colic um, and that the movements he was having were startle reflex um, and completely nothing to do with with how unsettled he was. Um, and even at this point, we're describing that they're not happening when he's fallen asleep. They're happening at all other times. But they were predominantly when he was falling asleep. So it still fell into that startle reflex uh, category. Um, we're now, it's been happening now from about two going into three weeks. Um, we were, we're now progressing to take him to A&E because we know something's not right. I'm pretty convinced that he's having some sort of um, seizure by this point because it's just one limb moving and his eyes movement as well, his eyes rolling back, we're getting really concerning. Um, so between uh, John and I, we've taken him to Amy a few times. Of course, we have a baby girl as well, so we can always both go, one had to go. It was um, a really exhausting, terrifying time when you just know something's wrong, but we don't know what. And at this point, epilepsy had never even come into our mind. We, we didn't know anything about epilepsy. By that point, um, so on one of our frequent trips to A&E, it was John that was there. Um, no, sorry, before he went, it was a Sunday. Um, we'd been up all night with him. These movements were happening all night. Um, so we had Googled extreme startle reflex on the Saturday and, and gone into um, come across a website about infantile spasms. 
um, that had lots of videos of exactly the type of movements that Archer had been having for the, the past four weeks at this point. Um, so we couldn't deny that that they the looked like that. It looked exactly like that. Um, so John took him up to A and E again. Um, unfortunately, these movements would never happen when there was any sort of health professional around. So nobody had really seen them by this point. Um, but we had accumulated lots of videos by this stage of it happening um, at all different times of day and night and uh, different scenarios, wide awake, falling asleep, waking it up. Um, so we had quite a lot to show them. But John was an a &E. um, He explained all of this that I've just said there um, and the doctor still was just about to discharge him and say it's colic, it's starter reflex, it's nothing to worry about. Um, and some babies are just really unsettled with wind and, and other sorts of problems. And they had at this point as well put them on a non-dairy formula milk, a kind of prescription milk, um, which he, he was refusing that as well. So he wasn't really drinking that either. Um, so it was an awful shame by this point. Um, it's not, not a very nice start in life for him. Um, so yeah, so that evening at A&E, um, showed the videos, explained it all, no, colic, start a reflex and you can go home. Um, so just as John was leaving, Archer was lying on, on the bed and started to have one of these movements and he had just literally shouted on a doctor that was passing, just a doctor we hadn't seen before, who was passing Archer's room um, and asked her to come in quick and have a look. Um, she came in and she straight away when she seen him, she said, no, that doesn't, um, that does look like something we have to look at a bit further and I'll get a, uh, um, a specialist consultant to phone you in the morning. Um, and that consultant was our wonderful, one of our wonderful doctors. Um, Dr Finlay at Cross House Hospital in Ayrshire. Um, so she did call in the morning. This was a Monday morning. Um, and this is where VK8 stepped in um, because we explained we've got all these videos of all these different times. And she said just she invited us to use the VK8 app um, that Professor Sperry has been part of um, creating along with you guys. Um, so she said that if we uploaded these videos, then Professor Zaberi, who was a consultant neurologist, a specialist in epilepsy at the Glasgow um, Children's Hospital, he would be able to look at them and he would he would be able to tell straight away um, whether it was epileptic seizures or not. Um, so we did that. We uploaded all these videos to the app and all the information that came along with it. Before the end of the day, um, Professor Zaberi had said, yep, we need to get a look at Archer. We need to get him an EEG. Um, so we were in on the Tuesday for an EEG um, and then we had to take that home. So it was an ambulatory EEG that went overnight um, into the Wednesday, back to hospital, take that off. And by Thursday, um, between Dr. Finlay and Professor Zaberi and all the results from the EEG and everything, the videos they'd seen on VK8 and all the information they'd give them, they could completely confirm that Archer was having epileptic seizures. And by this point, it was around 15 per day. Um, and it four weeks old that is and it's so such could have such a, an impact on his development at that point like a really serious impact on his learning ability at that point um so yeah at that point we were admitted to hospital within the hour we were asked to go home and grab some stuff and um and the full family we could stay in hospital um during lockdown as well um so it was nice that we could all be there um together and um yeah from there um, we were in hospital for, I think, three or four weeks um, between both hospitals, Ayrshire, and we were moved, later moved to Children's Hospital. Um, and there it was a case of EEGs, video EEG, lots and lots of tests, um, which we knew how important they were, but it wasn't nice to see. He was so tiny. He was only um, £5.2 when he was born, so he was tiny to go through all these tests. But, um, but yeah. They got to the bottom of it and they, they got him on medication and he was um, released from hospital at the end of October and very, very thankful to see and do not take it for granted um, that since then he, his seizures have been under control completely. Um, so yeah, um, that's, um, that's, just, that's how we got to where we are just now, I guess. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you for for sharing your family's experience and your son's experience of of epilepsy and of his diagnosis. I think you summarised it so well when you said it was just an exhausting and terrifying time. It sounds yep. it sounds exactly that. And to go through 
all those those you know hours hours of crying all of the infantile spasms and not knowing what they were yet and then it's so amazing that then in the matter of what two to three days you had a diagnosis yep. confirmed that must have been a huge um a huge relief to it to finally have some answers for you yep yep absolutely and all it took was to get right in front of the right person and what had happened if john hadn't have just asked this that this doctor who we'd, we'd never met before to come in and have a look and what if she'd said the same thing it was colleague and whatnot i mean how long could this have gone on for um, and we know of a story of um, another lady whose daughter's now in her 30s who could tell the exact same story I've just told you there about her daughter, unfortunately went undiagnosed for the best part of a year. Her daughter's now in her 30s and she's had severe learning difficulties her entire life. That's how serious it could have been. So we're just so, so grateful that that, that doctor came in at the right time and that then we were we just seen the right people after that and everything moved so quickly after that. I'm so grateful. Yeah, and I... I know it exactly that, that the early diagnosis and the right treatment has hopefully then prevented side effects had it had it gone undiagnosed. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story. Um, I wonder if we could ask a, a couple of questions now, if that's OK. Um, yeah. And the first question is from our Shape Epilepsy Research Network questionnaire. Um, what has been the main way that epilepsy has interrupted your life and your family's life? Oh, goodness. At the start, as I say, those movements started at four weeks old. He was actually eight weeks when he was diagnosed. I, think I might have said um, four weeks there, but he was eight weeks when he actually got diagnosed. Um, God, a huge interruption. That's my first um, baby, babies. Um, and so I'm a new mum, same for John, and we were... You're already terrified, you know, when you've got these two brand new babies that were tiny. Um, but to add all of that in as well, and in the middle of the pandemic as well, we were still in a, a vague lockdown at that point, not a total lockdown. Um, but then having all those trips back and forwards to hospital and doctors and then actually being in hospital, I think it was three or four weeks all in, had completely took away time that we should have been at home as a family and bonding and bonding with his sister and um just doing the newborn things that you do when everyone's happy and healthy and we just didn't have that we had it so scary and so stressful at the start and just awful for Archer to have to go through all of that and that was his start in life was just so unfair and some of the tests he had were really invasive and um yeah not nice so it took away a really important part of the start of his life for him and for us as a family that you just you can't get that back and don't get me wrong he's doing great now and and we're, we're all good now but yeah it really interrupted what should have been a really nice time at home I guess. Of course and especially when you know as you said Archer is a twin you had um, his sister as well to to look after and and during a pandemic it must have been an incredibly stressful time for you all. It, yeah so it really just sounds completely terrifying. Yep, definitely was. We did not know what we were dealing with to say, you know, something's wrong, but we didn't know what until we started to kind of do our own investigations. Of course, you're scared to look these things up as well, because there's all sorts of horror stories come up when you start to Google things. But we had no choice. We had to try and figure out what on earth was going on. Um, yeah, so it wasn't very nice. Yeah. And what one thing do you think would be life changing for you in terms of your son's epilepsy? Um... I don't know if this is a cut and dry one. As I said, we are so lucky and we never take it for granted and we never take our eye off the ball at either. We watch Archer like a hawk. Any odd movements or new movements, we kind of check in. Um, but we are very lucky that we've um, he's been his seizures have been under control since the end of October last year. Um, so a lot of um, tweaking medication when he was in hospital um, and since we came out. Um, and he's actually, we've actually managed to get him from three medications down to one as well. So we do not take for granted that we're so lucky because we hear lots of stories where that's not the case, that they might, kids and people might with epilepsy are on medication, but still not seizure, the seizures are still not controlled. Um, but we do live every day with that slight fear that if something could, some just keep an eye on him, something could happen today. So it's just not gone away. And um, we do worry about what his future holds and if he'll always be on medication um, and we worry about his development as well. So I guess for us, although we have the, the right medication to keep seizures controlled, 
for us what would be life changing is just to take that away altogether. Some, you know, a cure, which um, an overall complete cure that we, he doesn't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about that, that we know they would never have a seizure again and it's not something he'll ever have to deal with. So I guess that's um, a big ambition of ours is that there would be no epilepsy, there would be a medication that can just keep it under control completely and he'll never even need to know what that feels like. Of course, something that could even prevent the, the epilepsy from from taking hold or prevent it from occurring in the first place. It, yep. it's, it is ambitious, but I think it's what a lot of researchers are, are striving for at the minute too. Yeah. 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 And so our, our final question is, what are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? Well, I guess, as I've said, huge ambitious um, hope would be that there's a cure for everyone that's, uh, that's got epilepsy. That would be grand. But um, in the absence of that, if medication does have to be a part of Archer's life, then we're hoping for as much research as possible and new medications to make sure that the side effects, you know, there's no side effects. Again, ambitious, but ideally no side effects or very little so that he can continue to live his life to the full and do whatever it is he wants to do and not have epilepsy, as you see, interrupt um, his life or any plans that he wants to make um, while he's on medication. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today about you and your family and your son's experiences of epilepsy and diagnosis. Um, and we, Professor Zaberi uh, wrote a blog for us back in April, so we'll be sharing the, um, the details of that blog about the vCreate Neuro um, program in, in the chat bar below. So thank you so much, Amanda. That's all, pleasure. And Professor Zaberi is one of Archer's doctors and a magnificent doctor. We're so lucky to have him on our side. Um, along with Dr Finlay, that's Archer's two main consultants. Um, and of course, um, the funding from Epilepsy Research UK helped be create happen as well. So anything we can do to give back, we will absolutely do. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, for joining us earlier this month. And if you would like to hear more about Professor Samir Zaberi's work using vCreate Neuro, which is supported by Epilepsy Research UK, we'll link to Professor Zaberi's blog at the end of this webinar. And now I would like to introduce Professor John Terry, who is Director of the Centre of Systems Modelling and Quantitative Biomedicine at the University of Birmingham and is a member of our Scientific Advisory Committee. John was funded by Epilepsy Research UK in 2012 to investigate the use of mathematics to inform epilepsy diagnosis. Over to you, John. Hey, thanks so much, Quiva. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Quiva. Uh, my name is John Terry. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Birmingham. I'm going to be talking about some work that was partly funded by Epilepsy Research UK and how it has the potential uh, to transform the way that we currently undertake epilepsy diagnosis. A lot of the work I do uh, is in collaboration with Bessel Voldman, who is uh, an Epilepsy Research UK funded emerging leader fellow, uh, who sadly can't be with us today, but he'll be uh, watching at home. I should also flag uh, for reasons of disclosure that uh, Vessel and myself are, are both co-founders and major shareholders in a spin-out company, Neuronostics, that is seeking to provide clinical decision support and home management uh, for people with suspected epilepsy. So do bear that in mind uh, during my talk. So as we know, epilepsy is a condition that's characterized by the tendency to have recurrent and spontaneous seizures where regions of the brain, the neurons in them, synchronize their activity and that electrical uh, activity being synchronous causes uh, physiological and physical symptoms. Now, because of this, there's a primary diagnostic tool for epilepsy, the EEG, which measures the aggregated electrical activity of the brain. And what we're hoping to achieve here is capturing electrical signatures of seizures. So this might be spikes or discharges or very occasionally uh, seizures themselves. But there's a real challenge here because for most people with epilepsy, for most of the time, they don't have seizures. And so that means that about 70% of all EEGs recorded in first seizure clinics are currently considered clinically negative. There's no real information in the EEG in the way that we currently interpret it to suggest that this is someone with epilepsy or not. So as a consequence, 
uh, EEG has quite low yield with, you know, 25 to 56% sensitivity. And this has a significant impact on diagnosis. So there's a lot of delays. You know, the average time to confirm a diagnosis of epilepsy is greater than a year. There's lots of uncertainty. There's been studies published recently which suggest that as many as 40% of cases are misdiagnosed in general neurology settings. And there's a lot of qualitative decision making, by which I mean if we have the same individual with the same case history seen by two different people, they may come to two quite different conclusions. So what we're looking to do is to make a lot of this more quantitative using mathematical models and computer algorithms to better interrogate these routinely acquired clinical recordings. And before I tell you specifically about how we do that using these models, I just want to talk a little bit more generally about models. And uh, I want to introduce a, a quote by Norbert Wiener, who a few years ago now said that the best material model of a cat is another or preferably the same cat. Now, I want to now extend this a little bit and think what that means in the context of the epileptic brain. So if we update this quote, we have that the best material model of a human epileptic brain is another, or preferably the same human epileptic brain. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm doing this, but what I want to walk through here is to just consider how good an approximation to the human epileptic brain is another or preferably the same human epileptic brain. Well, let's start off with the identical twin of someone with epilepsy. So there we have a genetic replica of that individual. So we'd be tempted to think this is going to be a really good uh, model of the human epileptic brain. But in actual fact, there isn't a really, really strong concordance in identical twins. So if one identical twin has epilepsy, it's more likely than not that the other twin won't have epilepsy. And even in cases where they do have epilepsy, very often they have different types of epilepsy. So although there's a genetic link, it's not really, really strong, which means that actually a genetically identical replica of the human epileptic brain may not be the best model of that human epileptic brain. So if we extend that a bit further, Vena says, well, preferably the same human epileptic brain. But actually, even then, there are limitations because... Some people have multiple types of seizures. They don't always have the same type of seizure, which means that if we were to use information about one seizure type and try to generalize it across the life course of that individual, we'd miss lots of things about their epilepsy. And for some people, they actually have a combination of epileptic and non-epileptic seizures, which makes the situation even more complicated. And the reason I'm saying this is because very often when we think about using other types of models, so computer models or mathematical models, we think they're very limited compared to actually studying the human. But my point is that actually all of these models have limitations. And of course, computer models have limitations too. They're only as good as the equations that we use to describe certain features. So for example, how does the brain transition from states that look healthy to states that look like seizures. We can describe those using equations and we can use these equations to try and make sense of how seizures start, but there are limitations because I haven't considered any of the mechanisms by which seizures stop. So I can't say anything about how the seizure might end or when it might come back, but I can talk in this context about how seizures might start. So the main point really to make is, as George Box put it, all models are wrong, and some are useful, or in an updated version of that quote, all models are right, but most are useless. So really what our challenge here is to ensure that the models that we use are actually meaningful and add value. And to do that, we need to be really clear about what the question is that we're seeking to address. So in the context of epilepsy diagnosis, I'm gonna take us back now to the EEG. So. In a first seizure clinic where someone's suspected of having epilepsy, we'll record uh, from these electrodes around 20 to 30 minutes of data typically in the first instance. And as I mentioned, the vast majority of these recordings don't show any features that suggest in the traditional sense that this is someone with epilepsy. So how our approach works is as follows. We take short segments of this data and we transform that into a computer model of the human brain. And we're personalizing the model by using these EEG recordings. And how we do that is we look at the interactions between each of the 
different channels of data and we decide using that information and whether or not there's a connection between the regions of brain underlying the uh, electrodes. And once we've done this, we have this network representation that we can then in turn provide equations that, as I mentioned, describe transitions from healthy states as simulated on a computer and pathological states or seizure-like states as simulated on a computer. And then what we can do is we can simulate over large periods of time very quickly on a computer. So of course, if we wanted to get a year's worth of data from a human, we'd have to put an EEG cap on them uh, and wait for a year and see what we saw. Whereas on the computer, we can simulate these sorts of periods of time very, very quickly. It takes a few seconds on a high performance computer to get a whole year's worth of simulated data. And we can ask questions about how easy is it for seizure-like behavior to emerge in these personalized models. And the easier it is for those seizure-like states to emerge, the bigger the risk that this is someone with epilepsy. So we end up getting what we call a, a risk score or the BioEP risk marker. So BioEP is short for biomarker of epilepsy. And what happens here is we have databases of historic cases of people without epilepsy and people with epilepsy. And we can use that to tune the values of these parameters to give an idea of, of the risk of future seizures and therefore whether or not this is someone with epilepsy. And there are a number of analogies here. So if you think about it in terms of diabetes, for example, we have a blood marker called HbA1c, which essentially measures how sugary your blood is. And we use that marker to decide whether or not someone has diabetes instead of waiting for the complications of diabetes to set in. So we don't wait for a foot to go gangrenous or for uh, a retinopathy to develop before thinking there might be something wrong. We actually use this blood marker to decide whether or not we should treat this person as if they have diabetes. And that's not because if we didn't do anything tomorrow, something bad would necessarily happen. But we know that the risk of not doing anything grows exponentially as that marker, the HbA1c, gets higher. And this is very much what we're looking to do with epilepsy diagnosis. So rather than waiting for seizures to occur or being confident that we've seen seizures, we actually want to say that the risk of future events is such that we should treat this person as having epilepsy and put them on medication to reduce that risk. Much in the same way that if you went to the mechanic and said you thought there was a problem with your car, you wouldn't expect the mechanic to ask you to drive down the road so they could watch what happens when you're in your car. And if you had a crash, they say, oh yes, there's a problem with the brakes or the tires. Rather, you'd expect them to measure the tread or measure how much wear is on your brakes and decide to take preemptive action. So how do these sorts of models perform? Well, if we just considered some of these markers as a standalone diagnostic, which is not where we imagine them to be used clinically, but just for the purpose of comparing their performance, we say, take 20 seconds of data, classify this as an individual with epilepsy or not. How do we do in comparison with the known outcomes of, of a set of people? And what we find is that we achieve rates of around 60% sensitivity and 87% specificity. And what that means in comparison to the current clinical pathway uh, is very promising. So we, we seem to be as sensitive or slightly more sensitive than the entire clinical pathway using just 20 seconds of data that you collect at the very first EEG. Whereas in contrast, you could have many, many follow-up EEGs over a long period of time before you get to the same place. So as one of our clinical colleagues puts it, we're not a magic bullet here, but what we're seeing is an uplift in performance equivalent to the entire clinical diagnostic journey, but from that very first EEG. And we're accelerating the speed with which these sorts of tools can actually benefit people. Uh, through our spin-out company, Neuronostics, we're currently funded by the NIHR through their artificial intelligence and health and care call. Uh, and this is supporting the product development for a clinical platform which will provide decision support to clinicians. So a clinician will be collecting the data as they always will. And then we can run that data through our algorithms and provide a report that provides additional information. So that clinician, along with all of the metadata and all of the case history that they currently collect, uh, they can make 
decisions about whether to, for example, fast track someone for further data collection or to put them on anti-epilepsy medications, for example. We're also developing a smartphone app called Connect App, which will ultimately enable uh, information that people will collect on a day-to-day -day basis to also inform the clinical decision making so that these are all cloud-based systems. The data is sent and stored very securely uh, in the cloud. And this will enable ultimately, you know, neurologists to make real-time decisions about how best to ultimately uh, manage uh, people's epilepsy or to confirm their diagnosis. And if you want to find out more, you don't just have to take my word for it. Um, just last month, uh, Nature published a profile on Neuronostics, looking at how we can actually use these computer models to accelerate the diagnosis of epilepsy. Uh, and it's a great starting point to find out more about some of our research. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, John. That was so interesting. I um, Some really interesting statistics there. A 40% misdiagnosis rate, which is just really, really huge. And then it was so fascinating to hear about the use of computational modeling to simulate one year's worth of data in seconds. So in theory, do you think there's a role for computational modeling to accelerate research as such? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think one of the important things to note with some of these statistics is that these misdiagnosis rates are occurring in, in what we would call general neurology centers. So rather than centers where they have specialist epileptologists or people with deep expertise in epilepsy, uh, where, where the, the standard of diagnosis is obviously much, much higher, for many people with epilepsy, they simply don't have access to those experts. You know, and this, this occurs in the UK very commonly. And of course, in, in overseas territories, that can be even more common. Um, so there's real power in using these sorts of approaches to, to actually augment the expertise of neurologists, neurophysiologists, uh, and to hopefully enable better and more quantitative decision making. Because as I mentioned, you know, objectivity is a real issue here that different experts will make very different decisions, even given the same same um data so it's really important that we think about these sorts of challenges of course thank you so much john and we'll be coming back to you um in a in a little while for some of the questions that have been submitted but for now thank you so much Thanks. and finally i'd like to introduce dr eleanor lugara from university college london who is currently funded by an epilepsy research uk endeavor project grant to investigate breath and sweat biomarker analysis to help diagnose seizures, which may one day lead to a breathalyzer test. Please do tell us more, Eleonora. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kiva, and thank you for the invitation. Today, I'm presenting on behalf of the team with whom I'm very fortunate to get funded by Epilepsy Research UK. And before I start, I want to highlight as other researchers did before me, how important and great this initiative is because um, it is a great opportunity, uh, not just uh, to share our research with uh, other researchers, but also to a broader audience. So today I will talk about the, ba uh, the background of this idea, where this idea come from, um, what is uh, breath and why we decided to go for breath analysis and also an outline of the research that, that we are doing at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in collaboration with Imperial College. So um, the idea comes from a multiplicity of different views, um, both from a personal perspective, a scientific and a social one. A few years back, um, uh, in fact, a dear friend of mine happened to be in a situation where she had a, um, an experience of loss of, loss of consciousness, um, after which she had uh, headaches, dizziness, uh, muscle pain, and she had to go multiple times to ER and to a GP, and eventually ended up to a specialist before even the remote possibility of epilepsy um, came up. This time um, was obviously very stressful for, for her, for her family, and made me realize um, that uh, epilepsy is not just a syndrome of which we still don't, um, we have to learn uh, about the mechanism, but there are also many more unmet clinical needs. 
And speaking of unmet clinical needs, um, in fact, uh, misdiagnosis is a very common problem, um, which still heavily relies on the history of the patients and possible testimony of witnesses, which in a large proportion of cases is not always possible to have. And secondly, another method to diagnose epilepsy is the analysis of prolactin and lactic acid in the serum. But firstly, it's a relatively invasive procedure. And secondly, is not very reliable and sensitive enough for patients with focal epilepsy or those with, uh, with non-epileptic events. So video EEG telemetry remains still the gold standard for the final diagnosis, but it takes time and the commitment of the patient. So on top of the risk of untreated seizure for those patients affected by different types of epilepsy and remaining undiagnosed, it has been estimated that a large proportion of patients, I was a bit more optimistic here, 25%, um, are still uh, misdiagnosed. And these patients, um, they are undergoing anti-epileptic treatments, suffering not just from side effects, but also from social st stigma. The third part of this idea come from anecdotal reports uh, suggested um, that some pet, suggesting that some pet's dog are able to alert their owners about imminent seizures, but the cues potentially used by these dogs are still unknown. Uh, indeed, right we were, when we were about to collect our preliminary data, this encouraging paper uh, came out. And in this work, this group showed that the dogs were able to distinguish with quite good reliability breath and sweat samples coming from patients either having uh, a seizure, doing some sort of physical exercise, or at rest. And this is uh, obviously great news, uh, but um, it takes a lot of time and investment to train one of these dogs. And not everyone affected by epilepsy might have the chance to have a dog in their homes. Um, on top of it, this is not one off the shelf solution. Uh, and there is no guarantee that the dog trained to detect a specific other uh, person odor might also be able to detect the one of another person. And since there is no clear understanding of the mechanisms behind. So during history, uh, there have been a few examples of how breath can be a valuable indicator of what's going on in our body. And the most famous example uh, uh, is the identification of the alcohol in our breath since uh, 1967. Um, in the recent years, breath research has started to be more and more popular. This is mainly because the sample collection is fast and easy with little or not discomfort during the sample collection procedure. Um, breath analysis is already used in uh, clinical testing for other diseases such as cancer, and it could be used out of hospital as a possible, as a portable device, possibly. So what are the components uh, in our breath, uh, present in our breath, that we can identify? Well, breath is composed uh, by nitrogen, oxygen, water molecules, and carbon dioxide. And just 1% of breath is formed by volatile organic compounds, which are small molecules um, with a simple structure. And these can be haldates, uh, alkanes, ketones, and so on. They can arise endogenously as a byproduct of our metabolism, but also from the microbiome in our gut or in our oral cavity. And importantly, uh, BOC, the, these volatile compounds, can also derive from exogenous sources, which sometimes can mask the signal from coming from our body. For example, when we eat, we people that smoke, the medication that we take, and even the room that we're standing in can mask or can influence and affect sometimes this, this signal. These small molecules then are present in our bloodstream and they, they are exchanged in the lungs. So our hypothesis is that there are box signatures that can be used to distinguish seizure from non-seizure events. And we would like to determine the unique breath and sweat uh, signature of patients with different seizure types. And this would also include patients that they think that they have epilepsy, but in reality, they, they haven't. And develop a non-invasive di diagnostic tool for these disorders. So what we did in our pilot study was that after individualization of the patients of interest, um, we were taking different baseline breath uh, at the moment of hospitalization and in case there was a change in their medication. 
and then we were collecting breath at different time points after the occurrence of an epileptic event. The tube was then uh, shipped to our collaborators uh, at Imperial College and the sample were analyzed by a specific type of mass spectrometry. In our case, we successfully enrolled in the study 11 patients, three of which uh, needed to be uh, excluded a priori, five of which had the focal or generalized epilepsy with loss of awareness, two of them had aura uh, with loss of awareness, and one patient turned out not to be epileptic, but to have psychogen psychogenic seizure. So as you can see from the graph in red, uh, the bottom left of the page, we found out that certain bumps are increased in a time-dependent way after an epileptic seizure, as compared to a patient with, a, with psychogenic seizures at the same time points, as you can see in blue. This is true also for other type of volatile compounds, which I do not have the time to show you here today. And generally, we found out that some volatile organic compounds have high changes in concentration in epileptic patients as compared to patients with other type of moderate attack, but not epileptic ones. So to conclude, with this grant, we would like to continue and expand this study by robustly identifying changes in exhaled volatile compounds in specific seizure types in the general population, so that we could build a tool that could, that could be useful as a first test in emergency situations and as a screening method to distinguish epilepsy from other types of blackout. Thank you again to, your collaborate, to our collaborators in Imperial College, Professor George Hanna, Dr. Pierce Boshi, and especially Dr. Ilaria Belluomo, which has been a key partner in developing the idea, and she is a great expert in breath. Thank you to Professor uh, Matthew Walker in UCL, the physicians and the staff of the telemetry units where we performed the, our pilot study and Epilepsy Research UK to believe in this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. That was so interesting to think that, you know, in, in emergency, accident and emergencies across the UK that a, a simple breathalyzer test, that would save a huge amount of time and resource, wouldn't it? We hope so. Yes, indeed. <laughs> wow, that's so fascinating. Well, I'd like to uh, reintroduce uh, Professor John Terry back to the discussion because we've got some some great questions that have been submitted by uh, people watching, by researchers and by Epilepsy Research UK staff as well. Um, so thank you so much. You've both spoken about two potentially revolutionary methods of diagnosis. And traditionally, brain scans are used to diagnose epilepsy and EEGs as well. Will these technologies replace the older methods or do you think they'll complement them perhaps? John, how about you? Um, well, they certainly won't replace them in our case uh, because with, without the EEG, uh, we, we can't actually do our analysis. So our analysis is reliant on EEG uh, and we've deliberately worked where possible with just routine clinically acquired data to ensure that the technologies we're developing will fit in with the clinical pathway as much as possible. So we very much hope to augment and complement the, the expertise that people have and certainly not replace them, no. Thank you. And Eleonora, how about you? Yeah, they will definitely not replace, but they will, uh, um, they, because they have two different purposes related to the uh, breathalyzer. So uh, a scan do not tell you if you have epilepsy, but it's mostly complemented with um, uh, brain surgery or for EEG diagnostic to show you some uh, anatomical lesions. So also they would be used in two different settings. The, the, um, the breathalyzer could be used for a, a first visit to a GP where you suspect something and in uh, emergency settings while this uh, these scans can rarely be, be used without uh, some preparation. Thank you. So I think there's there's a definite role for both of the technologies that you've discussed to help streamline the current diagnosis processes. Really, that that would be so brilliant for um, for helping with the misdiagnosis issues that you've both discussed. And I mean, certainly from, from, from hearing the, the talk, I mean, there's clear potential in a GP surgery where they don't have EEG machines, they don't have the ability to collect data as a pre-screening tool to use a breath test would 
would be amazing. And, you know, at the moment, most GPs are simply referring on to, to hospital anyone who they have, you know, even the remotest suspicion might have epilepsy because they don't have any ability in, in the surgery to, to make that decision. So something like that could be amazing, yeah. Thank you. Yes, it, def it really would be amazing. And I wonder for both of your projects, what the next steps are and how long do you think it will be before this research benefits people living with epilepsy? Eleonora? Um, so for us, the first step is uh, to confirm that we what we have seen in the pilot studies. Um, and then in case uh, we confirm, um, we either could go for a bigger study to understand it, that what we've seen in this medium-sized clinical study we see also in the general population. And in the meantime, also to uh, think about uh, really to build up this device, uh, um, which would also serve, um, which would also need uh, a few tests before running smoothly, I would say. And John, how about your research? Um, well, uh, you know, in 2018, we, we spun out Neuronostics from uh, the University of Exeter, uh, specifically with the view to accelerate the translation of some of these fundamental research findings into uh, benefits for people with suspected epilepsy. And uh, we're really hopeful that within the next 24 to 36 months that we'll be seeing uh, this technology used in the clinic. Uh, but actually our home home management tool ConnectEp could well be in in the hands of people uh, with suspected epilepsy much much sooner than that and uh, you know recently the company completed a seed funding round and so we've been uh, hiring a number of roles recently we're going to have a couple of clinical scientists joining the team we've got a data scientist joining uh, all with a view to ensuring that the products that we're developing are as fit for purpose as possible fit in with uh, the current clinical pathways in order to maximize the likelihood of their uptake. So I'm really excited about that. Brilliant. That's so exciting. Thank you, John. And our next question is, you've, you've both spoken about how this research could impact people living with epilepsy, but have people affected by epilepsy been involved in your work? And if so, how has this added value to the research? John, you're nodding already. So... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people with epilepsy were, were fundamental to us pursuing the issue of diagnosis. And I think it, this is a great example of the importance of stakeholder engagement and involving a very wide number of people and perspectives in framing your research questions and prioritizing them. So traditionally, we would work with clinical scientists, clinical researchers, uh, and those researchers would typically be in the big epilepsy centers and tell us that, you know, diagnosis, they're pretty, pretty firm on diagnosis. Prognosis is a big challenge. We don't know what drugs to give people, but diagnosis, we're, we're pretty good. And yet, if you speak to almost everybody with epilepsy, and especially people with suspected epilepsy, who it turned out had a differential condition, particularly, say, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, they won't tell you that diagnosis was pretty good. They will say it took a long, long time. It was hugely uncertain. Even when I received a diagnosis, I didn't know what it meant. It wasn't clear to me whether the treatment was going to work or not. You know, there were so many issues. It was such a different perspective. And it was, you know, their input has been absolutely vital. And we have lived experience groups affiliated to both our university group and to Neuronostics who work with us very carefully in developing our our products and our research questions to ensure that they really are addressing the challenges that people with uh, epilepsy or suspected epilepsy are facing. That's so brilliant to hear. And Eleonora, how about your work? Have people with epilepsy been involved? Uh, yes, indeed, they are the main characters of our research, I would say. And uh, especially at the beginning, it, it was um, very, at the first stages when we were developing even the, the protocol, um, it was very uh, good to see their engagement. They were very uh, curious and happy and hopeful, hopefully that this would work. So it was a boost for like a very good thing for us that we were on the right track. 
um, and also they would, uh, um, well, in the future, they, they will actually test the device and tell us if it's comfortable about enough for them or, or not. We will also have, uh, hopefully, uh, stakeholders to uh, have a feedback on, on our device. And um, but during the, the preliminary study, also, uh, patients were giving us some advice on logistics, on really how to um, uh, how to ameliorate the organization, also of uh, the breath, breath collection and uh, and so on. So it was very important for us. Yeah, and that sounds so valuable. And both of your projects, people affected by epilepsy, have been involved at, at various stages, not just in in speaking about your work, but throughout the, the process. And yeah, that's so brilliant to hear. And if anyone uh, watching the webinar is interested in getting involved in research into epilepsy, we'll be sharing the details of our Shape Epilepsy Research Network in the chat bar just at the end of the webinar as well. So please do feel free to join or share with anyone you think may be wishing to join up. And so our I can't believe it's time for our final question of the webinar already. Uh, this is a question that we ask everyone who takes part in our webinar. Um, and that is, what are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? So John, if you'd like to, to begin with that one. Uh, sure, I mean, I guess for me that the hope is that mathematical models, computational tools can really revolutionize how we not only diagnose, but ultimately manage the condition. So epilepsy is, is such a dynamic disease, you know, from seizures that last maybe a second to, you know, a few seconds to a few minutes at max, the periods of time when you don't have seizures, you know, to the life course of the condition where some people might develop epilepsy aged four or five and grow out of it aged 10 or 11 or have a lifelong relationship with the condition all of these different time scales interact with each other and mathematical models have the potential to reveal hidden patterns in these data that can be actually meaningful for people with epilepsy and so i think some of the great challenges that i'm personally focused on are, are things like how the internal physiological parts of the system our human body so for example uh, stress hormones or other hormones, how do they interplay with the brain and create conditions that make seizures more likely in some people? So if you speak to people with epilepsy, uh, about 40% of them will say that stress or stressful situations make their seizures far more likely. But what's the actual physiological basis of that? And can we actually use uh, wearable technologies and non-invasive uh, recordings to actually enable people to have better control over when their seizures, you know, ex expectations and when their seizures might occur and enable them to take control of their lives accordingly. You know, I think there's so much potential here. And mathematics and computer algorithms has really the, the potential to reveal this information from uh, sources that people can wear very easily. You know, there are things like rings these days that can actually record your sleep quality, your heart rate your heart rate variability your skin conductance your temperature the amazing range of things and it's as easy as just wearing it on your finger and charging it up every three or four days and there's such potential i think for these sorts of wearables to to lead to improvements in management of epilepsy it's really exciting yeah that sounds so exciting and with all of that data collection there can be so much information and and so much learning from that as well Thank you so much, John. And Eleonora, what are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? Uh, well, for um, what regards breath, we, do, we would also be able uh, somehow to predict seizure too, not just to give like uh, a diagnosis, uh, but it was, this will come uh, in a, in a at a later time point. And also I think that um, there should be a bit more focus on early diagnosis of uh, syndromes that could be already evaluated at early stage of fetal development uh, to avoid as much as possible comorbidities and cognitive problems for the, for the children. Of course. And I think if, um, yeah, you're so, you're so right. If we can improve diagnosis and diagnose people with epilepsy at an earlier stage, then you can mitigate the, the, side, the potential side effects or 
associated conditions. That's, yeah, so, so important and such great answers to our questions. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to both of you for speaking with us about your research today. Thanks, John and Eleonora, for speaking um, so about such exciting areas of research uh, in epilepsy diagnosis. And if anyone uh, watching is interested to hear more from John and Eleonora and from Amanda and about Samir's project that Amanda was involved in, then please do go to the research blog section of our website. We'll be sharing the link in the chat section in just a moment. All of our contributors today have written a blog for us, so you can head there to find out more. And a huge thank you to Amanda, of course, for joining us earlier in the month to discuss her family's experience of epilepsy and epilepsy diagnosis through the vCreate Neuro app. So thank you so much, Amanda. So these research projects that we've heard about today are funded by our fabulous fundraisers who walk, run, cycle, bake, the list goes on to raise money for vital research into epilepsy. And a huge thank you to each and every one of you for your support. And if you've been inspired to fundraise, then why not take part in our six for the 600 challenge? All you need to do is think of an activity based around the number six, 60, or even 600, if you're thinking, let's go big here. And your challenge can be absolutely anything you want it to be. So get your thinking caps on and we'll leave a link uh, to the relevant page on our website in the chat now. So again, a huge thank you to all of our speakers today, to Amanda, to John, to Eleonora for taking part in this. Um, a huge thank you to James and Becca for ensuring that the tech runs smoothly and a huge thank you to all of you for watching and joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next research roundtable. Thanks so much and bye.